This is CBS. Coming up, a special report on the remarkable story of Sergeant David Mack, the Minneapolis police officer who has emerged from a coma that was once believed to be irreversible. Peace reigned today at the Bureau of Engraving when work resumed at the scene of one of the most violent strikes in recent Minnesota history. Israeli troops continue to ring Beirut, warning residents to flee and the Palestinians to give up. And new charges are just circulating on Capitol Hill tonight in the sex scandal involving congressional pages and congressmen. The story's coming up on an expanded edition of the 10 p.m. report. For years, southern chickens have been trucked into Minnesota. Now, Golden Plum, the only chicken grown in Minnesota, declares war, presenting the Golden Plump Chicken Corps an elite flock dedicated to stopping the invasion of southern chickens and to ensuring that every store offers you golden plump chickens, the freshest chicken money can buy. So go ahead, Minnesota. Eat well tonight. Golden plump chickens are guarding your table. On the next John Davidson Show, stars are saying the most surprising things. Mike Farrell comments on the future of man. There comes a time when all good things come to an end. Paddle Tales host Bert Condy has to play his own revealing game. I'm afraid to answer. And all my children, Susan Lucci, talks about her evil character. I you don't... must say I don't think of Erica as evil. I just think of her as a girl who wants to have a great time. Don't miss the surprises on the next John Davidson Show. WCCO Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. <laughs> Officer David Mack is the story of the determination of the human spirit. Shot in the line of duty, he endured 22 months of coma. Since then, he has been making miraculous progress toward a new life. David Mack's story is part of this special edition of the 10 p.m. report. But we open tonight's expanded 10 p.m. report with the latest from the Bureau of Engraving in Northeast Minneapolis. Doug. Well, it was back to work today for some of the people who were involved in the most bitter strike in recent Minnesota history. About 250 union members returned to their jobs at the Bureau of Engraving today. Mike Walter was there. It dragged on for more than 10 weeks, this strike by 760 members of the Graphic Arts Union. And crossing the picket line became a daily ritual, a running of the gauntlet for 170 non-union workers hired during the strike. The violence resulted in more than 40 arrests the past three weeks alone. Dozens of vehicles vandalized, non-union workers harassed, one non-union employee wounded by gunfire. Today, only a pile of crumpled pickets serves as silent evidence of the strike. Union and plant officials said the first shift of 75 workers functioned without incident. The plant manager said it was a busy day, but a rather quiet one. Union members, however, were surprised and angered to see some non-union employees who started during the strike still working. Uh, a, few, a few faces that I didn't recognize. How were the feelings toward them? Well, uh, we don't uh, really care about those guys. Were there any problems? No. Confrontations? No. No. No confrontations. The scabs? How many of them are there? There's supposed to be 14 of them. Did you see them? Most of them. Did you have a confrontation and problem? No. Non-union employee Kim Wolf worked at the plant for six weeks during the strike. The car she rode to work sustained $800 worth of damage from rocks and sticks. Well, just about the time we reached the entrance, we both had sick stomachs. Really emotional about it. Lock their doors and just hope for the best. What were your feelings when you saw rocks coming at the car? Well, we cried a couple of days and we were shaking from it. We didn't know if they were going to break windows or what they were going to do. Just said that if violence pays. That doing that to somebody, that's what they got their jobs back for, abusing us every day. How does that make you feel? Mad. I don't think it's right. I don't think any of those people deserve their jobs. Kim Wolf and other non-union employees who chose not to stay on here were given up to 25 days of severance pay. And the company also kicked in some money to repair vehicles that were damaged in this long and bitter strike. I'm Mike Walcher, WCCO Television News at the Bureau of Engraving in Northeast Minneapolis.
Tomorrow morning, 17 Twin Cities hospital administrators will be served with official notice of a nurse's strike. The notices were prepared today by the Minnesota Nurses Association. The association has set July 14th as a strike date. Hospital administrators have said that they would begin cutting back on the patient population and staff once they receive the notices. And there was another development today in that contract dispute. The mediator asked both sides to return to the bargaining table this next Thursday. Judge Crane Winton has the authority tonight to return to his job on the head of the district court bench. The Minnesota Supreme Court has reinstated Judge Winton, ending a two-month suspension that began when he was charged with sexual misconduct involving young, young men. Last week, the judge pleaded guilty to two misdemeanor charges of hiring adult men for sex. The final decision on his career may rest on the recommendation of the Judicial Board of Standards, a board which could decide no discipline is warranted or it could recommend the judge's removal from the bench. Yesterday's allegations of illicit sex between congressmen and young congressional pages had drawn from official Washington such words as flabbergasted, shocked, incredulous, depressing. The charges first came to light through CBS News and reporter John Ferruccia, who has this update. A former congressional page involved in the investigation of favors for sex was a client of a Washington callboy ring. CBS News has obtained records taken from this Georgetown townhouse in a police raid in March of this year. Police say the house was being used as a homosexual call service. Arlington, Virginia police, accompanied by an FBI agent, raided the house looking for enough evidence to convict its owner on pandering charges. What they say they found are names, addresses, and telephone numbers of more than a thousand clients, including some well-known Washington men. And they found the names of about 200 callboys. Among the client names is that of this 18-year-old former page. He says influential congressional staff members have used him as a middleman to set up liaisons with homosexual prostitutes. In return, he says, they offered him assurances of promotion. The page has been interviewed by the FBI in its investigation into whether congressmen have offered male and female pages jobs and promotions in return for sex. Federal officials say sexual preference is not the issue in the investigation. The former page says he has set up several congressional staffers with homosexual prostitutes. At, at first, it was out of the ordinary for me, uh, but then, you know, I kind of saw how things were working, and, uh, and then it became mundane. It was just something, something to do to... Uh, to ensure me, you know, what I wanted to have, you know, in the event that I did decide to stay. Um, it was just like an insurance policy for me, uh, that if I did want to continue working on the Hill, that I would have a job. Records obtained by CBS News show that two homosexual prostitutes were sent to this congressional page dormitory in August of last year. And one of the prostitutes has confirmed to CBS News that the sexual meeting took place at the Page dormitory. This former Page said he resigned, but House doorkeeper James Malloy told some congressional staffs that the Page was sent home after allegations of prostitution and drug abuse. Malloy says allegations of sexual relations between Pages and congressmen surprises him, but he is not ready to abolish the Page system. I think there is something somebody has to look at, take a hard look at the thing. Uh, uh, but, you know, to make that quick decision and to arrive at that conclusion that you should abolish the system because of what somebody's alleged now, and I assume there might, there might be something here. I don't know, though. You know? House Speaker Tip O'Neill says he's disturbed by the allegations and says the House will cooperate fully with the Justice Department investigation. Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker said, quote, I was flabbergasted. It really is a depressing thing. This afternoon, he met with Attorney General William French Smith to discuss the matter. CBS News has been told that no senators are involved. House Ethics Committee Chairman Louis Stokes calls the allegations serious and says his committee will begin an immediate investigation. And he says when the House reconvenes, a resolution will be introduced to ensure the committee has authority to investigate the allegations fully. John Perugia, CBS News, Capitol Hill. In San Jose, California today, a crowd of reporters from Japan descended on the courthouse to cover the arraignment of eight Japanese businessmen. The defendants are employees of Itachi and Mitsubishi and are accused of trying to buy stolen documents containing secret information about a new IBM computer. They were caught in a government sting operation, but today all pleaded not guilty. Eight others accused in the case are now in Japan, but are supposed to make a court appearance in the U.S. later this month. Authorities in Hennepin County have been catching lawbreakers at a record rate. In Minneapolis, the police expect to issue about 32,000 speeding tags by the end of this year. That compares with uh, just 14,000 last year. Not only has the number of citations increased, but so has the price. 
As of today, the fine for a moving violation increased 20% to $33 for the first violation and $44 for the second. A 53-year-old Minneapolis man is dead tonight after fire raged through an abandoned house in North Minneapolis overnight. The blaze at 1807 North 5th Street broke out just before midnight, and once the flames were out, authorities discovered the body of Wesley Jack Gruggs in the rubble. Police say vagrants frequently use the building for shelter. Minneapolis authorities are also investigating a downtown drowning tonight in the swimming pool of the Hyatt Regency Hotel. A young man, said to be about 30 years of age, was found lying on the bottom of the pool early this evening by an employee of the hotel. His identity has not as yet been released. Efforts continue tonight in, uh, to uh, negotiate the Palestine Liberation Organization's disarmament and evacuation from Beirut. Before dawn today, Israel delivered a warning of the consequences should the negotiation fail. Israeli jets thundered over Beirut in a mock air raid, dropping flares and smoke bombs. As panicked residents ran into basements and bomb shelters, the raid came as an Israeli official warned, we are reaching the limit of our patience. This is the third week of Israel's siege of Beirut. Hospitals continue to fill with wounded for whom there are very few medical supplies. On both sides of the conflict in Lebanon are men and women prepared to die for their cause and for now trying to cope with the horrors of war. And such people as 19-year-old Puad Had Ibrahim, a mathematics student and restaurant manager before the fighting erupted. Now a dedicated Palestinian guerrilla who writes poetry about the bloodshed around him. Many of his poems dwell on death these days. Ibrahim expects his people will lose. I can take it. Huh? Uh, when we have uh, uh, not enough, uh, uh, we can't do nothing. We prefer uh, seven shots and my friends and the lots will be on me. When you are surrounded, and there's nothing you can do, you must kill yourself. Are you prepared to do that? <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm intending to do that. And I, I prefer that, and then uh, I'll be happy for that, because I don't like them to put their hand on me. The Food and Drug Administration has turned a thumbs down on the latest diet fad. That story coming up when the 10 p.m. report resumes. It's the biggest family day around. Plus, now there's something new. The spectacular Pepsi-Cola IMAX Theater. Then, every so often, Valley Fair offers an extra special added attraction. Celebrate Independence Day on the 3rd or 4th of July at Valley Fair. On both nights, you'll be thrilled by the biggest, most spectacular aerial fireworks around. Plus, Valley Fair is open extra hours until midnight, both Saturday and Sunday. Blue Nun. A delicious imported premium white wine. Just down the road, real nearby, there's a 24-hour instant cash banking center. Does anything a teller can. It's fast, it's easy, always a convenience. Sometimes a downright necessity. Instant cash. See a Northwestern bank. Thank you, friend. I hate to paint. So when I do it, I prepare right. Use quality tools, and I go for a house paint that gives me a strong finish. Olympic overcoat house paint. Overcoat goes on easy, holds on strong. So when I'm finished, I'm finished for a long time. Olympic paints and stains. One strong finish after another. Now save $4 per gallon at Budget Power Centers and Lampert Lumber. A correction. The drowning of the 30-year-old unidentified man we reported a moment ago took place at the Regency Plaza Hotel, not at the Hyatt Regency, as we had indicated. They are the latest rage among diet-conscious uh, Americans. They are pills which contain an extraction of kidney beans, and they're called starch blockers. Users say they're too good to be true. Imagine eating all the spaghetti, the spuds, and the bread you want, aware that the starch blocker pill will prevent your body from absorbing the carbohydrates. Consumers say they I work. I think it's fantastic for anybody that eats a lot of bread or carbohydrates. I happen to like that stuff. So it, it helps me. And I've lost weight. 
Until now, the starch blockers have been sold as a food, but today the FDA said, ah, 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 can't do that, because it's actually an untested drug. We don't know if it's of, uh, of danger. We do know that there have been some uh, acute effects. Some people who are on the uh, product have uh, had some gastrointestinal uh, complaints. But what we're even more concerned about is what the long-term uh, hazard is. And today, the FDA ordered all starch blockers off the shelves. We have more disquieting news about the food we eat, Doug. Well, hard to kill bacteria that infect farm animals can pose a problem to people as well. In today's issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, researchers reported that drug-resistant strains of salmonella bacteria can be transmitted from animals to people by eating infected meat. They also found that the bacteria can transfer their resistance to, to the uh, drug onto other bacteria. Well, our health and science reporter, psychologist Dr. Larry Kuttner, looked into the story. Nearly half the antibiotics sold in the United States are used on farm animals. They're used in two ways in high levels to kill bacteria and treat disease, and in low levels to encourage rapid growth. Occasionally, bacteria, such as salmonella, get into the animal's food and infect the animal. High levels of antibiotics kill the bacteria, but when low levels are used, only the sensitive strains of the bacteria are killed. And during the presence of feeding of low level of antibiotics, then the resistant strains have a chance to proliferate. These drug-resistant bacteria get into the meat of the animal and into people when they eat that meat. The information that allows the bacteria to resist the drugs is stored in the bacteria's genes. Unlike animals, bacteria can transfer their genes, like the genes for resisting antibiotics, not just to their offspring, but to other bacteria as well. That's what concerns the researchers. In theory, it means that the use of low levels of antibiotics in the food of farm animals could lead to their harboring drug-resistant bacteria, and that by eating the meat from those animals, people could have the bacteria in them made resistant to drugs. According to the University's School of Veterinary Medicine, most meat containing salmonella and other harmful bacteria is stopped by meat inspectors and packing plants. And the way to kill the bacteria on what little infected meat does reach the grocery store shelves is not to store it at room temperature and to cook it thoroughly. With photographer Rick Olson, Dr. Larry Kuttner, WCCO Television News, St. Paul. We do have a bit of good medical news tonight. A six-year-old girl is in good condition tonight at the University of Minnesota Hospitals after undergoing a kidney transplant. Sarah Tews of Tampa, Florida, got the kidney from her mother during a five-hour operation. The successful transplant is especially good news for the Tews family since Sarah had already gone through two kidney transplants that failed. Well, some low-income residents of Ramsey County will have to make ends meet with less money. The county's general assistance program got an overhaul today. State and federal budget cuts forced the county to reduce monthly general assistance benefits. And that means about 1,500 general assistance recipients will receive about $18 less a month. But county officials say the 500 refugees on general assistance will be the hardest hit since they have already lost a third of their benefits from other cutbacks. A plan to incinerate hazardous chemical waste in St. Paul is becoming an ever hotter issue. Environmentalists warn that the state can't control the dangerous PCBs well enough as it is, and that the plan makes everyone within 50 miles of St. Paul guinea pigs. Tom Hendrick has the story. Incineration can produce dioxins. Dioxins are 100,000 times more poisonous than cyanide. Alleging misuse and abuse of PCBs in Minnesota and lack of control by the state, the West St. Paul Citizens Organization and five environmental groups are demanding the plan to burn the chemical at the St. Paul High Bridge power plant be scrapped. NSP says PCBs could be used for fuel safely, and the Pollution Control Agency favors monitored incineration over midnight dumping, which officials say is the alternative. Environmentalists point to two recent PCB emergencies as examples. At Hill Murray High School in Maplewood, the Pollution Control Agency didn't even know the chemicals were being used until last week's accident. No certificate of use was ever issued. At Hannah Mining Company on the Iron Range, the other example, the state did authorize use, but not dumping, which has occurred and threatens water supply. At any rate, those at the news conference stress they do not want to be guinea pigs to an experiment which could drop fallout for up to 50 miles. They question the plan and the Pollution Control Agency's record of controlling this pollution and worried that eventually there could be PCBs shipped here from all over the country. Why should we feel secure when our local regulatory agency and our local power company assure us that burning PCBs is safe? 
Are we to believe that this burning in downtown St. Paul can be accident-free for 20 full years? In fact, the matter is, is creating a psychological fear, which is a contaminant in itself. Fear of the unknown and fear that the PCBs will damage the human being. Public hearings on this PCB disposal issue will begin in August. In the meantime, the effectiveness of the Pollution Control Agency is becoming the center of the controversy. Hysteria is not the goal, critics say, but they add that concern, deep concern, is justified by the record. I'm Tom Hendrick, WCCO Television News, St. Paul. In 1978, Arnie Carlson became the first Republican seeking statewide office to receive the endorsement of the state AFL-CIO and Mr. Carlson was elected auditor that year. Today, the AFL-CIO decided against endorsing Carlson for a second time, nor did it endorse his DFL opponent, Paul Wellstone. Arnie Carlson was just two votes shy of winning endorsement and could still be endorsed at the AFL-CIO state convention in September. Endorsements went down the line of DFL candidates with the exception of Rudy Perpich, who was running for governor, and he did not seek the endorsement. The changing of the guard at the State Department of Washington was caused by a clash of personalities, not issues. That word today from Michael Deaver on the resignation of State Secretary Alexander Haig. In an interview with the San Francisco Chronicle, the presidential aide said that Mr. Reagan was not comfortable with Haig's combative style and preferred a team player. Coming up in a moment, our special expanded report on police officer David Mack. Bite into a taco, and this is what usually happens. My name is Tio Sancho, and I have made a taco shell that won't fall apart on me. Want to know my secret? Tio Sancho's taco shell is slightly thick, crisp, but not so brittle. Look for my Tio Sancho taco shells. The taco shells that won't fall apart on you. Good news for everyone. Annie is here, says Gene Shallot, NBC. The New York Daily News says four stars. Carol Burnett is a constant source of laughter. Wouldn't you like to see the bedroom? My little billiard hole? Pat Collins of CBS says Annie's the 4th of July, a day at the beach, and a summer vacation. Carol Burnett certain to win an Oscar. Why any kid would want to be an orphan is beyond me. Rated PG. Now playing at a theater near you. Hi, I've been telling you about the huge selections and incredibly low prices at the Minneapolis Miracle, the clothing distribution center. But what's really amazing is the quality of their clothing. Suits, sport coats, and slacks from the world's top makers. Famous labels that confirm their value. Luxury fabrics from the finest mills, like this wool blend vested suit, just $99.90, about half what you'd expect to pay. Come to Clothing Distribution Center. Get the clothing quality you really want for a lot less money. Goodyear announces four for the fourth. Come up to Goodyear now and get a set of four Power Street 2 tires on sale. Power Street 2 is the new improved diagonal ply tire from Goodyear. Power Street 2, a tire that won't let you down. Get four Power Street 2 black walls on sale through Saturday for $114. Size A7813. Save now. Come up to Goodyear. There are precious few stories we encounter in our day-to-day -day coverage of the news that demand special treatment, but we have one such story tonight. The story of Minneapolis police officer David Mack, his wife, family, friends, and the medical community which has treated him since he was shot and then lapsed into a coma in December of 1979. Reporters Ann Rubenstein and David Nimmer and photographers Keith Brown and Jeff Coffer prepared this special report which begins at 28th and Pillsbury in South Minneapolis where Sergeant Mack and five others were serving a search warrant to one Riley Housley III. It was a winter afternoon, about 10 minutes to 3. It was Thursday, December 13, 1979. <laughs> An ambulance speeding 80 miles an hour 
Sheriff rushed David Mack to the Hennepin County Medical Center. And as he was wheeled through these doors, no one knew it then, but part of his life was over. David Mack was wounded by a 32 caliber automatic. He was hit in the abdomen, and another slug tore through the side of his neck. He was in a coma. The very next day, doctors suspected the worst. Uh, there was no doubt that the underlying cause of his coma and the seizures was a uh, lack of oxygen, lack of blood to the brain, secondary to his not breathing, not being ventilated while he was uh, transported from the scene of the shooting to the emergency room. The main reason he wasn't being ventilated is because his uh, teeth and jaw were uh, clenched, shutly, uh, clenched tightly shut, and, uh, and so they couldn't insert an airway. It didn't look good at that point, and the family was informed that there was a likely possibility that if he did survive that hospitalization, that he would do extremely poorly in terms of regaining intellectual functions. That definitely was a denial thing for me, because it just, no, uh-uh, this isn't, you're wrong, you're wrong, that's not my David, <laughs> you know. I didn't want to believe that right all. That word alone just seemed like it was a, a brick wall, and I was running into this brick wall. It just seemed, no, uh-uh, this isn't happening at all. What was happening is what doctors would later call a persistent vegetative state. David was there, but not really. He was breathing with the help of a respirator, but he couldn't react to anything. His brain wouldn't allow him. He couldn't speak, and no one knows if he could see or even hear things. His body was just there. All I wanted, I didn't want David to suffer. Even so, I was reassured by everybody that David really doesn't feel suffering. You know, I, I still thought that some way he's got to be hurting. And I just didn't want him to be hurting anymore. At that point, even then, I sort of discussed it with the, one of the doctors that if you're absolutely positive that it is that bad and you don't think that there's much hope at all, then take him off the machines, let it be. And uh, his comment at that time was, since David was still alive, that was definitely very amoral. And I couldn't believe that he said that. <laughs> I think I was more crushed then than I was before. And the months that followed were worse than before. As expected, David's condition didn't change. His body was being fed by an IV. He was getting antibiotics to prevent an infection. And he was breathing on a respirator. No change, no hope. That was not life as David Mack would have wanted it. And his police friends knew it. They knew it because David was a physical, strong man an aggressive policeman, and an athlete who skied and played baseball. And they knew it because they and David had talked about disability several years ago, over a few beers. It all came about because of Tom Halsey, who was a policeman who was injured uh, in a motorcycle accident. And Tom uh, uh, was living in, in misery, I think, from the time of his accident until he died here about oh, a year and a half ago or two. Uh, uh, we all felt so sorry for Tom, and, uh, and we talked about him, and we talked about the fact that if we had to live like Tom, we'd feel the same way, that uh, we, we would not want to continue our life. During the next several months, Maxwell and David's other friends signed affidavits, telling the court and the doctors that David would have wanted the life supports removed that he would have chosen death. Marlise felt the same way, and so she called upon a police chaplain to help her sort through the issues. That sorting took eight months. Nobody wanted to make mistakes. Nobody wanted to get hurt. Um, nobody wanted to have something come back at them uh, six months from now or a year from now. Uh, we talked about several different viewpoints, Catholic viewpoint, Protestant viewpoint, uh, even the Jewish viewpoint. We, 
pastor brought an Old Testament and New Testament uh, dealing with that specific issue and saying uh, that only God gives life and only God takes it away. If it's meant that uh, you pull the plugs and David continues living, then it's just not his time to go. Um, that was an issue, and it needed to be dealt with that she was not David's executioner in some way or another by, by pulling the plug. On August 18, 1980, a Saturday afternoon, life support machines were removed from David Mack's body. I remember the day. It wasn't quite as dramatic as uh, some people try to make it <laughs> look like it. You know, I mean, it really is, the doctors are not ceremoniously <laughs> kneeling and unplugging this <laughs> machine, you know, I mean. The decision had been made and we finally have all agreed and now it is was time. And uh, so, turn off the machine. What were you feeling? Dread, fear, fear that I, that I maybe regret my decision. Um, different things, yeah, mostly fear that, you know, give me the strength to know that I did the right decision. Two months later, David showed no change and was moved to the St. Anthony nursing home where, quite frankly, he was expected to die. He was given basic care, he was cleaned, and he was kept comfortable, but there was no change in his condition. David stayed the same while the world went on without him. And outside St. Anthony nursing home, life was going on. You may remember, we had 50 American hostages in Iran at that time. In fact, they had been in captivity more than a year. Jimmy Carter was running the country from the White House. Ronald Reagan was on the way in. And there was a big hole in downtown Minneapolis that one day would turn into the Metro Dome. David Mack missed all of that and more. Doctors think his world was a void without sights or sounds, and they believed that until a Thursday afternoon. It was October 22nd of 1981. On that day, a young resident, Dr. Robert Nelson, stopped in to examine David as he had done once a month for a year. Nelson and a nurse stood over David's bed. I looked down and he was looking at us. And there's something about his eyes that was clearly different. First of all, they were not randomly looking around. He was focused on my face. And it's something difficult to define, but there was a, a spark of interest of, hey, doc, I'm listening to, I'm listening to what you're saying. And I, you know, I can't be. So I proceeded to confirm that by asking him to do a number of, of different things, many of which he was unable to do. He didn't have a lot of motor, motor function in his hands, for example, so he wasn't able to squeeze my fingers when I asked him. What I did discover was that through his eyes and face, he was able to respond. So for example, he hold his finger up like such and then say, David, look at it. Can you move it in various positions? and he focused on my finger and was able to track where I moved it. Nelson called in two other doctors the next day to watch David's change. Marlise didn't know about the change when she went up for a regular visit. She saw David following the simple commands. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. The first days were terrible were absolutely terrible because I, uh, I couldn't see, at, look at it as improvement at all. I could only, I could only look at the limitations. I couldn't see any further than that. And I was, afraid, very much afraid. I was afraid for David, because I don't know. I was afraid for David that he wouldn't be able to handle being locked into a, a body that wasn't moving. I didn't give David a lot, whole lot of credit for 
being able to take it, being able to, uh, to say, well, I am happy to be just alive. Okay, David. David has been here at the Sister Kenny Institute in Minneapolis for 56 days. The motions and the movements aren't back, but it is so obvious the man is. David cannot speak. It's not that he forgot how to communicate. It's just that his body won't allow him to. And so he must use a simple plastic board, an alphabet board, with clusters of letters. David nods or blinks an eye when someone points to a letter he wants to use. For a moment, consider the enormity of that task alone, having to literally spell out a letter at a time, all of your feelings, your needs, your emotions, even your wisecracks. What do you think of how the twins are doing this year so far? <laughs> There is laughter and happiness in David's life now, but it is always tempered by the struggles, the strain, and the hurting. In watching David, one recalls one of his wife's earlier fears. That fear was that could David learn to cope with living in a body that cannot move? Well, he's trying. Every single day, for eight hours, this man labors through intense therapy, trying to use muscles that haven't worked in two years. He is learning to hold his head up, to move his tongue, and to swallow food without choking. It is a step-by-step -step tedious process. He learns to swallow a spoonful of orange juice, and then he learns to swallow a spoonful of pudding. For David, progress comes in the tiniest of steps, but in themselves, remarkable achievements. David, we were really impressed today with how hard you work in therapy. We noticed all of the things that you do, and and it looks very it looks very tough for you and we notice how good you're getting i'm wondering how you feel physically right now david as you're laying here how do you feel Is it N? Strong, we're strong. Strong. Okay. Yep. Because he is stronger now, David's life is no longer confined to a hospital room. He gets dressed, and with the help of his older son, Dennis, David gets around. Feels good. I like it now because now we're starting where just our family can do it. And I like it where we don't need help from other people. I, I like it where I can lift them out of the car, take them out of the car, and it just, you know, it makes me feel a lot better that we can get along without the help of nurses and other people for transportation. Since David's improvement, he has been home for visits, he has been to church and parties, even a ball game at the Metrodome. Last week, he joined his father, Harold Mack, at the stables. His younger son, Tom, was in a horse show there, and David surprised him by showing up. I was nervous that I was going to mess up, <laughs> and I was hoping he'd be proud of me, and I guess he was. <laughs> it shows that he can do it, and it makes me feel good that he can show up to stuff like that. And Makes me feel good to have him there. I always dreamt he'd wake up and and come home. <laughs> or happen like it is right now, at least recovering. And getting out of the hospital to visit with family and friends means as much to David. I'm wondering when the first chance, David, that you had to get outside the hospital to go see what's outside. Things you hadn't seen for two years. What first struck you about life outside the hospital bed? 
outside the hospital room. I'm thinking whether it was the clothes people were wearing or the sunshine or whatever, but when you first had a chance to get outside a hospital room, what first struck you? F E E H O M See my home Okay. For as touching as those moments are, and the fact that David Mack has come a million miles, reality reminds us he's got twice that far to go. No one really knows what will happen with him, whether he'll one day talk or walk or what's ahead. What's left behind is clear that David Mack's case has created complicated issues for families, lawyers, and doctors. It, it makes it more difficult because you like to simplify it, you like to tell the family there's really no hope and that everybody knows about David's case and uh, it, it does create more uncertainty and uh, you have to be more cautious in what you say to the family and uh, because normally at three to six months out there's really no hope for recovery if they've been well documented and there's no intellectual functions and now you have a situation where uh, there's been a very dramatic and unexpected recovery of, uh, of intellectual functions. It was contrary to the medical experience at the time. It's made the decision more agonizing, more difficult for me professionally and for the family because there's always that one in a thousand or one in a hundred or one in a million case and uh, it makes the decision more painful, more difficult because we don't have the answers. I don't know why we're so special. I'm hope I'm hoping that it won't stir up too many false hopes for a lot of other people that might find themselves in the same situation that we were in before. I don't want other a lot of people to uh, to waste their lives on thinking, well, it has happened to David Mack. Maybe it can happen to my husband, to my son, to my father. This entire case raises those important and persistent questions. But when you're around David Mack, the issues are upstaged. Because David reminds us of what really matters. We've heard it time and time and time again. It's simple. David, what are the important, most important things a man can have in life? Jesus. Oh. God. God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. on the way back. Thank you, David. The man who shot David Mack is free on bond tonight. Right.